one and microphones are good and other than that. Oops. I was one of the first to go in during World War II, too. This is an interview with Mr. James Fletcher, born 3-30-1919. Interviewer is Robert Gardner. The date is March 11, 2004. Mr. Fletcher, can you tell me what war and branch of service that you served in? I fought during World War II. I started off in the 121st Infantry. I was in a rifle company to start off with, but I had worked six months as a photographer in Atlanta before I went in, and they put me in a signal company in the 121st, which I had infantry training, cryptographic, and radio, and uh, I fought during World War II. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I drafted. I was one of the first, about the capsule in Washington, they pulled out the first capsule, that was my number. See how lucky I am? I was one of the first selectees to be going service. Where were you living at the time? I was living in Atlanta on Dewey Street, southwest Atlanta. Do you recall your first days of service? My first day? Your first days in the service, sir. Well, I went in on the 21st out at Fort McPherson, and they didn't have barracks out there. They had CC camps back then, and we stayed in the CC barracks. And there was hundreds of troops out there that went in when I first went in. And uh, we had no idea where we was going or what it was. It was turmoil, really, because <laughs> there wasn't equipped for it. And I know uh, when I went through the line, they gave us a physical, and lots of them didn't pass. And uh, when I went through the line to get out of our clothes, they threw clothes out about three times as large as what you want. And I called out, I said, some captain gave me an outfit about twice my size. I said, hey, bud, this is too large for me. He come over to me and said, listen, soldier, you're in the Army. And don't you call me bud no more. You say sir when you speak to me. <laughs> so they told me earlier. Can you tell me about your boot camp or training experiences? Well, I was, uh, when I left Fort Mac, I was shipped to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where that's where all the selectees and the National Guard's outfit was training us there. And I had a place they called the Dust Bowl. I went to a close order drill, uh, M1 shooting rifles, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. And after we finished our basic training, President Roosevelt, he was one of the few presidents to come down to interviews. He'd come down to Fort Jackson and interview us. And uh, it was quite an honor there to have the president come by and interview us. Do you remember any of your instructors? No, I don't. How did you get through your, your basic training and your different trainings? I got through pretty good. It was real cold. Out there. We liked to froze that when it was so cold. It was one of the coldest ones we had in 41. And I went through my basic training pretty good, but one day I was standing there and this officer come up to me and I was nearly froze, you know. He said, soldier, are you sick? I said, no, sir, just froze. If I knew what I knew now, I said, yeah, I'm about to die and went to the hospital where it was warm, but I didn't. But I went through basic training and I found it, uh, finished April the 1st. That's when Roosevelt come down to see us. What war or wars did you serve in? Uh, I served in, uh, you mean the country? No, sir, the, the war. Just World War II. Where exactly did you go? Well, when I left here, uh, after they picked me, uh, I like I say, after I finished basic training, I went on maneuvers for about a year at Fort Jackson, Tennessee, and I was shipped to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. In Fort Leonard, Missouri, the uh, they picked 12 men from the 8th Division for a special mission. And they said, now this is strictly volunteer, because I was young and raised out volunteer for anything back then. So I volunteered not knowing where I was going. And they sent me to San Francisco, which I was on Angel Island, right outside San Francisco. And I took training there for about two weeks, and they put us on the USS West Point and sent us out in the Pacific. We didn't know where we was going. They wouldn't tell us. It was very secret. But the next stop we saw was Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, then our next stop was Melbourne, Australia. 
Then the rumors were we was going to North Africa where the desert fox was fighting in North Africa, the American and British. But then rumors got out we was going to Guadalcanal, and the next thing I know they found is they said we was going to Bombay, India. So I served in, uh, went to India, I went into Burma. Burma had been recaptured, you know, still uh, run out, and I was one of the first ones to go back into Burma after it was retaken. I mean, it was uh, evacuated, I mean. What was your job or assignment? Uh, my assignment, after I got to Lido or Sam, uh, we didn't know where, there was 120 of us when we got overseas. It was picked from different outfits. We went to Ramgar, India. That's where they was training Ch three Chinese divisions to go back into Burma. And right there, they split up a group up. One was to stay in the Indian, one was to go into China, and one was to go into Burma. But nobody wanted to go into Burma because they said they're dying like flies with fever. So I was scheduled to go to China. But two guys got sick uh, going to Burma, and they had to have two volunteers for Burma. And they asked for volunteers, and nobody volunteered. So I was one of the volunteers. They volunteered me. And from there, they gave us live ammunition, the gun, and sent us uh, uh, up in Assam, that's northern India, right close to the Tibet border in China. And we landed in a place called Chaboy. And uh, from there they put us on a truck and we rode all night to an outpost named Lido. And Lido, they uh, split up a group up. Some went with Chinese, some with the British, and they helped me back, said, uh, we'll save you back here. I said, oh boy, I finally got it made, you know. And one day I looked outside and saw this American leading a bunch of, looked like bandits out of the jungle, you know. I said, God, I'd hate to be in that outfit. And old General Boatner, he was in charge of it. And next day I looked on the bulletin board and my name was on there to join that outfit, you know. I said, oh my God, how can I be so lucky? <laughs> so that's the way I got in the Jingpo Rangers. Did you see combat? Yeah, I saw combat. I worked back up enemy lines. I was in two battles. I was in the Battle of Michina, which is one of the most famous battles in Burma. And, but I mostly worked back up enemy lines doing espionage work, blowing up bridges, uh, saboteur, collecting the information, and stuff like that. They had a price of 10,000 rubies on upper head. Were there many casualties in your unit? Uh, in 43, we lost, I think, six Americans and about, I worked with a native band, there's around 200 natives and six of us with each band. We lost about 15 or 17 of them. One of our guys I went on a mission with, he was beheaded. Three of them was killed, but he was beheaded and his head was staked in a village. And I'll never forget that. It was on my mind for quite a while. Can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Well, one was when I went into the headhunter country, and uh, I never had seen a headhunter before, and they looked like savage from the Stone Age days. And when we got in the village, there was about 25 heads hanging up on the wall, skulls, and I could just picture my head being up there on the wall, and that was one of my most frightening examples. And during the Battle of Mitchell, I. Uh, we was under fire all the time. That was, you know, quite scary at times. And when we was cut off back of enemy lines, uh, the Japs coming on us and we had to run for dear life. And we was back at 30 days without food, nothing, we survived. I got some articles I'll show later on in prison. Were you a prisoner of war? No. <clears throat> Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yeah, several of them. Would you like to discuss any of them? Well, or the circumstances I started that? to bring my medals with me, but I can't think of. Uh, when I was cut off back from the lines and we was give up for dead, uh, when we got back, the war correspondent, they made all kinds of pictures. My picture made the headlines of all the papers I'll show later on back in the States. I was awarded the Bronze Star for that. And the Meritocious Citation, I was awarded that in the Battle of Michinaw. But the other medals, I, I can't even think of, like World War II, the just routine medals, you know. And I got the campaign Burma Bar Medal at the house, too, which is very valuable. 
I bet six hundred dollars off. Of it's not something you want to sell. And I served with uh, with Merle's Marauders. I wasn't a Marauder, but I went with them uh, in the Battle of Mitchell. I was with them quite a bit during Burma. They were very famous during World War II. What was the highest rank that you attained? Uh, tech sergeant. How did you stay in touch with your family? V-mail. I got some of my family, some of my niece sent me some V-mail the other day. I hadn't seen one since World War II, and I still got some of my V-mail that I wrote home. And our mail was dropped to us by a parachute, and that's the only way we had to get mail. All of our supplies were dropped by parachute. And uh, it was like you saw a parachute come down with mail. It was like something from heaven to hear from somebody back home. We didn't hear from about every three or four months. And the first one, our mail uh, was taken out, it was taken out for runners, but then they had snatch time. Papa Cubs would snatch a cord and take our mail out later on in Burma. They improved a lot. What was the food like? The food, we eat native food most of the time. I eat everything from monkey meat, porcupine, barking deer, hornbill, and rice. Uh, I eat so much rice, I look like a Chinese. And when I come back home, uh, I was in by the, out for a big dinner, and they had a big bowl of rice on the table. I said, I don't want that. Did you have plenty of supplies? Uh, sometime we did. We didn't have food supplies most of the time, and sometimes we short on ammunition and explosive, you know, stuff like that. Did you feel pressure or stress? Well, sometime I was so scared I didn't know really. I know when I went into China once, uh, we was ambushed on a trail up there, and a uh, bullet went through my canteen during the battle, and the water leaked out all over me, and uh, I was relieved to know that the water come from the canteen after the battle over. I was so scared at the time I thought I'd wet my pants, you know. <laughs> But stress, uh, a lot of the soldiers cracked up with fever and different things they had over there, but I don't, I don't guess I ever really cracked up. I hope not. I had typhus, malaria, was burnt real bad once, and was gassed with our own gas mustard gas, which I lost my hearing when I'm right here. Was there something special you did for good luck? Well, my daddy said he prayed for me every night I was over there. And I had a, a friend I met in Calcutta. They gave me a little statue of Jesus about this house. I started to bring that, but I didn't. And it's in an aluminum case. They carried it during World War II, and it's got um, a Mary holding Jesus. And they said, if you take that through the war, they'll bring you good luck. So some brought me good luck. But I've seen a few times tight places I was in, like we was cut off back of into my lines and they had us surrounded there. I thought I was a goner. And uh, I prayed a little. How did people entertain themselves? Uh, you mean the natives? Or you or yourself while you were oh, there? Oh, gosh, we didn't have no entertainment. Uh, the Chins, they had a ball, bamboo ball. I got some at the house. I should have brought one and showed it that you kick it back and forth. And outside that, uh, watching the parachutes come down, one time we saw them uh, on the Chinese holiday, they dropped ducks and geese, and they dropped live pigs, but the pigs, each pig had his own parachute. And that was the funniest sight I ever seen a pig come down the parachute. And two of them didn't open, and when they hit the ground, it just tore them all to pieces, so they had fresh pork all over the ground. And, uh, Another time they dropped us about 12 dozen of condoms. I don't know why they dropped in there because we didn't need them. So we came to the natives and they used them for blooms and we used them to keep our matches in and, you know, stuff we wanted waterproof, put over the barrel of our gun. That's the only. They was used everything but what they was made for, you know. What did you do when you were on leave or did you get any leave? Yeah, I got uh, two leaves to Calcutta, India. Uh, they flew us out. I was in there a year. Uh, you see, I went in there for the Lido Road was burnt. The Lido Road was uh, built to uh, join the Burma Road to get supplies back into China. And uh, they flew me back into Lido and sent me to Calcutta. And uh, the Indian trains or something else, they had wooden benches and you have to sleep on them. 
So me and uh, this other guy, my color, we went down to the, in Toledo, went down to the thing and saw what we had to ride. So we got a paper and then ordered office and signed our name as captains. And the next day we went down and told me as captains, forged our name, and we went to first class. They put two Indian wax out of the compartment. We rode all the way to Calicutta first class compartment. They didn't catch us, thank goodness. <laughs> but it didn't work coming back. We tried it coming back, it didn't work. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? You mean funny? Yes, sir. Well, uh, once we was in the Hukun Valley back of Amber Lines and the Kachins brought us a pet monkey. And uh, right after we got the pet monkey, the guy named Tuggle from Tennessee, he'd get up every morning, we cut off a toothbrush hanging on a bamboo hook. His toothbrush was dirty, yellow looking. And he said, anybody be fool around my toothbrush? He said, no. So. He'd get up the next morning, his toothbrush was dirty again. So one morning he got up, go to the restroom about uh, well, out in the open, uh, and then the monkey saw the monkey had his toothbrush scratching his behind with it. So he pulled his 45 and shot the monkey and that cleared the dirty toothbrush. And that was uh, one of the funniest things. And I told about the China, the Chinese. I have several more, but I won't bring them up. <laughs> Do you have any photographs of things you'd like to show? I have hundreds of photographs. Uh, when I was uh, cut off back of the lines in, uh, in 43, on Thanksgiving Day, the Kachins had killed us a uh, bark and deer. Bark and deer is a good meat in Burma, and there's on roasted fire. The Japs come in on us, and we had to run for dear life, and we was cut off for 30 days back then. And they'd give us up a day because they, of our radio, the hand generator, we lost it. And we had no communications. And we had quite a rough time for 30 days. We had to live off the line. But when I come back into Shembu Yang after about a month, we got back at Christmas 1943, there was war correspondents there. And they made all kinds of pictures. And uh, I made, uh, I didn't think much about that. They gave me leave. I went to Calcutta and got down there. It was in the paper down there. And then I began to get articles. And this is one of the articles that come in that Atlanta Journal, February 10, 1944, showed me that the Chins crossed the Chimlin River. And it's in lots of history books. It's in, uh, if you buy a World War II book, it's in there. And there's a new book just come out, Burma Road, it's in there. It just come out last month by Donovan Webster. Which one is you? Uh, that's me right here. That's fantastic. And uh, also, uh, I got the bronze star for that. This is a medal I got. And that's a picture of what I looked like back then. Oh, that's wonderful. And also, the war correspondent made lots of pictures. Uh, this is a small one. I didn't mean to show it. Uh, I'm also on the History Channel in a program called Spies. You will see me in two places in that, and that's one of the pictures you'll see on the spies. And uh, over the years, I've, uh, they've, uh, in 19, during World War II, they uh, put me in the Hall of Fame, my picture got it, and they made a poster on me, and this is a poster they made on me. That's a wonderful picture of you, Yeah, there. and that's, that hangs in the Hall of Fame, and it's in several museums. And this is another article I got that wrote me up about behind Japanese lines. That shows the elephants we use for supplies, and this is a bridge we blew up uh, back in '44. And it's sort of like the bridge on the river choir. And they built this bamboo bridge across here, and it's uh, made out of bamboo and vines. It's not a piece of metal, and it's over 100 feet long. And when you go back across, it weaves back and forth. <laughs> that's where that was north of Michinah. Oh, that's wonderful. But I got hundreds of pictures. I got a regular museum, my baby. I got Japanese mortars, Jap flags. 
Uh, I got one of the Jap flags I brought. Oh, on survival, uh, you want me to show that now? Yes, sir. When we was cut off back of the lines, we had no food to eat. They, they caught us unprepared. We had to live off the land, eating wild game, eating fish, monkey meat, porcupine, barking deer, anything we could. We didn't have no way of cooking, so we cooked our rice in green bamboo. Uh, and after it was done, they baked the fish and the thing we had to roast it because we had no cooking utensils. But they put our rice and stuff on a banana leaf. So I got tired of eating my fingers, so the Kachins made me a bamboo spoon. And this is actually the bamboo spoon I used for survival while I was back there. It's made out of bamboo. And they found some tea in an abandoned village, and uh, which they call pulup. I learned to speak the Kachin language. If this is a bamboo cup they made me to drink my hot tea. That's weaved out of bamboo. That's a section of bamboo cut and hollowed out. It's beautiful work, but that. Uh, every time I drink tea now, I taste green bamboo. So that's, what, uh, 50, 60 years old? Uh, 60, 60 years ago. 60 years old. It was, I was, I was 43, and it was 60 last year. That's, that's in, it's in beautiful, beautiful shape, fantastic shape. And, uh, Looks like I you can, keep, you, you I can have, still use it today. I have all kinds. I have bamboo balls that I brought back to me. You want me to show my flag now or later? Yes, sir. Uh, during the Battle of Michina, uh, uh I was in that battle. It started May the 2nd. It was one of the longest battles they ever fought in Burma. I captured several things I shipped and brought back, but this is a Japanese battle flag I got brought back. get it straight. But that's my battle flag. I had three of them I captured, but uh, the Air Corps was paying a hundred bucks for it, so I sold my other two. I couldn't afford not to sell them in. So I kept one of them. I brought this one back. Yes. I have a Japanese mortar, Jap rifle, Jap sword, uh, Jap money. Is that silk? Yeah. Beautiful. The funny thing, I had an interpreter a few years ago, and this little Japanese girl, she said, uh, they, that's for good luck, you know, the Japs cares about it. And uh, they said, don't get killed, kill the enemy and all this stuff. And uh, at the end of it, one of them, she wouldn't print it. And I said, why? She said, well, I don't want to. And her husband said, go ahead and tell me. He said, don't get syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> that's on the flag, too. Long. I got it in English translated. <laughs> I guess they want to cover uh, all is, bases. Uh, this is also in the battle when I had the, when I, that's made on the battlefield at Michina, when I, where I kept the flag. I also had a Japanese battle jacket. Most people have never seen a battle jacket, but somebody stole that from me. I don't have that no more. But I had a Jap battle jacket and a Jap flag at one time. That's really beautiful. It's and unusual uh, too. right after that uh, battle, a lot of typhus killed a lot of the men there, scrub typhus, and I went to Calcutta and uh, I contacted scrub typhus, but I was in a good hospital and I survived. I only weighed 115 pounds when I got out. They said I was lucky I survived. It killed about 95% of them. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. You want me to show the headhunter picture now? Yes, sir. Uh, I brought back uh, lots of headhunter stuff, and uh, we have a CBI convention here, and uh, we dress as natives that country. They call it the Poochie Parade. And uh, back in the 90s, I went, there's 200 there in the parade, some dressed as Chinese, some as Indians, but there never had been a headhunter. Uh, outfit in there, but I brought back the headhunter knife, the cap, the hat, spear, and everything. So I dressed as a headhunter that year in the convention, and I won first prize out of 200. And this is a picture of the way I looked back then. I would never have recognized you. you no, know, nobody else did. That's a fantastic outfit. Yeah. And I tell them, I show it to the girl, she said, God, you're the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I said, well, I agree with you. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
there's a Chinese officer one time, uh, they asked him, this war correspondent asked the Chinese officer, said, how you disciplined me into panic under fire? The Chinese officer answered and said, we shoot them. And that's about right. I've seen them execute them for desertion and everything. Do you recall the day your, your service ended? Yeah, June the 2nd, 1945. I'll never forget that day. Where, were, they, huh? where were you? Fort McPherson. They sent me back. I was inducted at Fort Mac and discharged at Fort Mac. Although they sent a, uh, they took me out on a bus, but when I was discharged, they gave me a car token to ride a streetcar home, which back then was seven and a half cents to ride a streetcar. What did you think of your officers and fellow soldiers? Uh, most of them was nice. They were nice guys. Uh, but every once in a while you'd hit a one that was pretty bad, you know. There's one officer, he was so bad that uh, uh, they were dropping supplies one time. They free dropped the rice and stuff like that, sugar. And this rice bag hit him and killed him. The men were so relieved they framed the rice bag, it hit him and killed him. But I've seen them uh, drop rice and sugar, and I've seen eight Chinese killed. They run out on the dropping field with, to try to catch it. And you can imagine a 75 pound, 100 pound bike of rice coming down to 100 miles an hour, and it, it just buried them. Uh, Chinese were poor educated, and they round them up like cattle in villages. They, they were out of the Kachins was native from uh, northern Burma. They were tribal. and. Uh, They've been fighting that war over for years, since 1962, for the right of you know, the Burmese government. They opened a uh, big museum in uh, uh, Rangoon now, which they've named it something like my mom, I think, like that. But they, they got the Kachin, about the Kachin land, and they got that river crossing, and the bridge, uh, a picture of me, I don't know where they got the picture, but they got it blowed up two feet or six feet of being a museum over Did you keep a personal diary? I kept a little book that I wrote down dates and, and villages, villages we captured and village I was in, like uh, Piper Cubs. You know, we didn't have helicopters. They flew us out with Piper Cubs. And one time when I was in Bombo in the battle, I caught my lair, and they flew me back, and the pilot kept telling me, look at that village down there. Get a good look. I said, I've been in a hundred of them villages. I don't have to look. <laughs> what did you do in the days and weeks after you were discharged from the military? Well, I come home, uh, I felt deserted. When I come home, we didn't get the welcome at most children. I mean, it was just, I come home, I was discharged, and that was it. And uh, when the war ended up town, I went up town, and uh, they really gave me the biggest welcome I ever had up there when the war ended in uh, Japan, you know. I was sent home after the war ended in Europe. And they give me high points. I had, if you had 85 points or more, you were, you were given discharge. And I, about, I, had, I had about 100 and something. So I was one of the first to be discharged on high points, and I was one of the first to go in in 41. Did you work or go back to school? Uh, I took about a month's vacation, went around, seeing my family. Then I come back and I went for an investigator for the government for about uh, six weeks. And then I went to work for the VA, which I didn't like. And two guys I was in, the 121st, where they come by and said, they hired a Southern Bell, let's go over and get a job. So I said, okay. So I went over and put my application in, and they called me about two weeks, and I went for the interview, and they never did, and they hired me a Southern Bell, so that's where I spent my entire career at Southern Bell, Bell South now. But it was a good company. I enjoyed my work, and that's the main thing. Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Yeah, uh, some of them I've stayed in contact over the years, but uh, most of them all of them are dead now. Some of the guys I was shipped overseas with, uh, there's only me and one more left. He lives in uh, Texas, Big Springs, Texas. And the ones I served with in 43, all of them are dead but me and Pete Lutkin. And uh, they have in there the World War II monument is opening in Washington this year, and they picked 40 veterans from Georgia to go, and I'm one of them they picked to go for the dedication, I think. Oh, that's fantastic. So they, they send us up on a chartered bus, hotel bill, they take us there and drop us off, everything is free. 
so I'm, I'm scheduled to go to Washington in May. Did you join a veterans organization? Yeah, I belong to several of them. <laughs> I belong to about seven, eight of them. I was uh, formed the veteran Atlanta Bastion here in Atlanta. I was the first commander of it. I organized it myself. And it had about a hundred and something members, but most of them died. But uh, I've been uh, national ever. I've been uh, national historian, national junior vice commander for the national convention. I've been on all kinds of committees over the years. Notice you're wearing a green beret. Is that any special significance? Well, the green beret, they originated from my outfit, the Special Forces in Fort Bragg. And uh, they come down last year and interviewed all this stuff in my house, and they, they told me I needed a green beret. Cap and I was organized. We helped to organize the outfit. And, uh, let me show you a picture here that I had made uh, up, uh, I can find it. Uh, it showed me in my green parade then and now what I look like then and what I look like now. Can you see it? Yes, sir. That's a, that's a fantastic honor to have them remember you that way. Yeah. I think that's, that's and really they got special. me in the. I'm in their museum up there also. They got lots of my stuff. They got a poster and different things. And, and, uh, I've been up the interview. They wanted to interview me up there. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, really, when I went in, I never had thought about war. I didn't. I always thought it was a. Uh, something excited, but uh, a war is awful. I mean, there's lots of memories in there that you, you never forget. Uh, we were strafed a lot uh, in our camp, and we had to be ready to jump in a trench or somewhere. And every time I come home, uh, if a plane flew over the house, I'd jump out of bed and hit the floor. And I know one time, about a month after I come home, I was on a streetcar coming down to the loud bust of thunder. And I jumped up on the streetcar and run to the back up and everybody looked at me and said, that guy's nuts, you know. <laughs> but it was just force of habit. I was so nervous. I was real nervous. They gave me a femur baba toe to take and I took too much on it. I felt like I was floating on there. Of course, you know, we was furnished opium to furnish the natives for food, information. And I saw what it done to them. Our coolers all smoked opium. And we had blocks of it was dropped to us by this big. Of course, the government denies they done it, but they did it. And uh, we'd have to give them opium. We paid them in opium, information. Everything was done with opium. And I, I saw what dope can do to you. I had no desire to take opium. Like Vietnam, a lot of the guys was on dope over there, but I never saw an American on dope the whole time I was over there. And the only things we ever got in our airdrops back in the jungle or drank and eat was cigarettes and beer and I didn't drink beer and I didn't smoke so I was just left out. What kind of activities do, does your veterans organization or associations that you belong to participate in? Well they have conventions every year. I belong to Merle Marauders, I belong to the CBI, I belong to the Burma Star, which is a British outfit. I so I serve with lots of the British overseas, so I'm a member of their organization. And uh, they just have conventions, get together and tell old war stories, I guess. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, it made me appreciate a lot of stuff I don't think I ever would. Uh, the hardship we went through with, and it's something you never forget the rest of your life, the terror you go through with. And see, we had a price of 10,000 rubies, but on our head, the enemy, we give them such a fit in the jungle, amb ambushing them and, you know, giving the information direct to the airplanes and to blow them up. That, uh, you was on edges all the time. Like I say, I never, if a leaf dropped you, was awake. That's how tense you was. It took me a long time to get over there. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? 
No, I think I covered it. Like I say, I was uh, working back at the lines for two and a half years. I served in China. I helped open the Burma Road into China during World War II. And uh, there's one thing about it. There was nothing dull the whole time I was in there. Was lots of people said they didn't have it. Like back in the end, you know, when they stayed back there, lots of them went nuts. But we had something. We was on the march every day. Very seldom we was at one place. We lived in bamboo lean-tos. Uh, I've also published my book called The Burma, Secret War in Burma. I published it about four or five years ago. It tells about my experience in Burma. It's got hundreds of pictures I've never seen before. When I went into Burma, they told me I couldn't carry a camera. And so after I got in there, I needed one, so I wrote back home and had them drop that camera. I wasn't supposed to have one, but I made pictures. It's Nobody else got. And the war correspondent, they, they sent me a lot of pictures too. But I got, uh, it tells about my experience in Burma. It's got, uh, a picture in here that tells about when I was cut off back the lines. And it tells uh, of how we survived back up of a native food and, and fighting with the Japs each day. When they, we set up ambushes for them on the river and let them get in the middle of the river before we'd ambush them. But I got lots of pictures in there. Was that a, that picture, was that a, a staged reenactment of Yeah, of when we concept? got back, the war correspondent was there and he said, y'all been give up for dead, we want to make pictures of it. And I guess he made a hundred pictures. I got lots of them now. And, uh, he had a stage just go back across the river and march just like we was going across it. That's the Chimlin River. And that, that, that was a stage. All of them stage pictures because they couldn't take it back to the lines because they wasn't back there. Now we had one war card before we went in there. Frank Martin, he wrote us up. I got the article at the house. Uh, he wanted to go with us on that mission, but the colonel I was with wouldn't let him go. Now I wish he could have went with it. He'd have got a story he'd never forgot, you know, from survival. Yeah, back then I think they were a little more worried about the about the civilians that were there, what would happen to them, or that you'd have to spend time protecting well, them. Uh, the Japs, they would chase us, and we, we was running for several days. <clears throat> One day we was crossing a paddy field, and there's two planes come out of nowhere. And we thought there's Jap Zeros fixing to strafe us. And we realized there's American planes, and the way we was dressed in native club, we waved at them, let them know, you know, that we were Americans, you know. And we'd point back, shoot them, don't do us, you know. And we didn't know where they were. They made about two or three paces over, so we thought they was going to shoot us, you know. So we rushed back in the germ, uh, germ, uh, jungle, and we heard them. They did strafe the Japs. And we never did see them again. But after that, we still cut our way, run into elephants. And uh, one of the Kachins accidentally shot one, and we were attacked by wild elephants that night, and they tore up our camp. We had them tall trees up the trees. So that has a pretty. Now, that's one of my scariest moments, too, when them uh, elephants attacked out of a camp, and I was afraid they was going to push the tree over. I was in over in the river, and I was going to swim. I didn't know they could swim. But I was so scared, I could feel a cold seal go up my spine out my hairline. And, uh, my knees were shaking so they were sore the next day. <laughs> but I had some scary moments over there. Yeah, that had to be an experience that you'll never forget. No, I'll never forget that. But then we run into another area. Of course, there was tigers in there, but they they wouldn't bother you unless you was hungry. There's wild cats and monkeys by the millions in there, hundreds, and they would give you position away. And uh, but that was a uh, that was a regular game. When I first went in there, I went with a bunch of them, and they cooked this monkey meat the second night out. And I said, God, I don't want no monkey meat. That's like eating your next door neighbor's dog or cat, you know. But you know, in China, they eat dogs, cats, and everything. I was a Chinese one time, and they invited us in, and I was eating the meal, it's pretty good meat. But the major asked what kind of meat that was, and he said, Bow Wow, and I couldn't eat another bite of it. I like to choke on what I had. Well, sometimes people gotta, gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, but then when we got supplies in there, it was like something from heaven, like the Battle of Mitchell, uh, they flew us in, uh, uh, steaks and ice cream, and the boy, that was like something from heaven. And I know one time a popper cub come in there to take up some of the wounded, and he had a loaf of bread, and 
on his plane. That was a loaf where they don't cut it, you know. We broke that bread into a billboard named Grafton, and we eat that solid bread. That was the best thing you ever eat, just solid bread. They have eaten that native food so long, you know. But see, I learned to speak their language, and I got lots of food given to me. When I went to China, it tells about that newspaper article how I was got the troops extra food, you know, but learned their language, you know. I spoke some Chinese. Uh, not too much. I, I knew uh, I knew what doggo meant. That's halt. And, and you, they, that they's crazy enough to shoot you. I say, "What be your being?" You know, <laughs> I'm American soldier. But uh, it what? was quite an experience I'll never forget. A lot of times you find that the 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 smallest things, like you mentioned, the loaf of bread, really meant a lot to you. Yeah, just a loaf of dry bread. That was the best step you ever eat. Just plain dry bread. It makes you appreciate a lot of other things that you have. Well, food, you just didn't get too much food out there because you know, lots of times the monsoons come and uh, you couldn't get food supplies. That's the reason we were slack on food. We were in the head on our village at that time. We, to get food, uh, they give us uh, chickens and uh, eggs, but I wouldn't eat the pigs. They brought us a pig or two to give, but they have a platform on the back of the bamboo. We lived in bamboo lean dudes in the house the whole time I was over. They have a platform, they relieve itself out on the back platform, and the pigs eat it, and I didn't want to eat it for that re response. So we'd have the chickens and eggs back, and we'd give them opium and uh, sugar and salt, and they never had seen sugar, they'd seen salt, and they thought it was sweet salt. They called it sweet salt, jump to eat. That's fantastic. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to answer? Well, I'm proud to be American. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time to do this interview with us. It's definitely been my pleasure. I really, yeah, really appreciate nice. this very much. I really enjoyed it. I have a lot more stuff I could bring in, but I won't. I have funny things that happen. And, uh, different things, like they had congealed eggs in China. And that's where they bury the egg in mud for about a year or something. So the Chinese was always trying to give it. They said it tastes like some kind of cheese. With imagine, with your imagination, it might taste like cheese. But without that, they taste like rotten eggs to me. I never would eat one. Well, thank you again, sir. It's been my pleasure.